tomorrow is a year that I uh, found my brother. And through the generosity here and through you guys' uh, prayers and all the things that you've given him, the encouraging notes, there was a, uh, a young lady who gave him a note the very first week that I found him. And he told me the other day that he reads it every day. So what you do matters. What you do matters. And I want to thank you. He has, uh, has a beautiful place to stay due to the generosity of an individual from church here. He has plenty to eat. He has a vehicle. He has his license back. He's got a savings account. He has a checking account, and he has purpose like you don't believe. And I want to thank you guys for supporting me and Becky. Last, last year, uh, tomorrow, a year ago, is when we drove up there to find him. And then I look back at all the things that happened. It, it's just quite impressive how God works. Amen? So thank you guys. You know what? Give yourselves a hand. That was amazing. I uh, through that story then, if, um, Kyle's father was uh, ailing in health, and he had heard about the story, and so he asked that I come into the uh, hospital there and tell him that story, and we had a wonderful time. It was that story that sort of moved him that day. It was, it was amazing. So just, just some awesome things. Now, church conference has asked me to speak at pastor's conference and they want me to bring my brother and they want me to tell the story at pastor's conference. So I, I plan to do that. I called him and I said, hey, out of all this, I've never really asked anything of you. <laughs> I said, uh, oh, he goes, oh boy, what's coming? I said, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, you're going to be there February the 20th. <laughs> he goes, oh, I got to pray about that. I said, I already did. God told me you're going to be there. <laughs> Forget it. You don't have to pray. It's been an awesome year, hasn't it? I uh, normally, last week I had a couple jokes. How many used any of them this week? Nobody used the gingerbread one? Yeah, all right, cool. Cookie sheets? Uh, yeah. Anyway, I don't have a joke this morning, but I have Phil here. Phil, would you come up here? Is that wrong? Did that come out wrong? Not at all. I, this is funny. Snowman holding money. Another snowman holding a hairdryer, and it says freeze. Love you too. I love you, man. <laughs> I knew he wanted people to see it. Merry Christmas, Phil. Love you, man. Uh, not everyone would be bold enough to wear that to church, so thank you so much. Christmas is fun, isn't it? God is good. I, uh, I've been getting attacked all morning. Uh, first of all, my keyboard on my computer wouldn't work, so I changed batteries, threw it around the room, halfway around the office in there, banging it. Last night, the microphone didn't work at the reception, so I banged it, and then it worked. So I thought, well, maybe my keyboard will do the same thing. I slammed it, didn't work, threw it halfway across the office, still don't work. And uh, so open your Bibles. <laughs> I don't have any overhead this morning. My, my computer was giving me fits. Uh, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. While you're paging that, I'll give you an update. Last Sunday, we got to pray for a special individual who was headed back to Nicaragua, Mr. Tommy, where it is that he made it home safely and all is well. Is that correct? So thank you for your prayers. He is an amazing young man, and I look forward to the day that I can meet him again and reconnect with him. As we go to Luke chapter 2, if, uh, if you need more time, say, yep, that's me and I'll wait. If not, we're at Luke chapter 2. I want you to go to verse 41. Now, I know you're already thinking uh, that's kind of odd, uh, 
why would you skip over the Christmas story? Well, Phil is always very proactive in giving me new Bibles. And this time he gave me this one. And uh, it's the New King James Version is what I'm going to be reading out of. And as I was reading the Christmas story, I went on. I went on past the actual birth of Jesus. And I found it very interesting how the New King James Version uh, would read the story. And I'm going to read it to you today. Is there a 12-year-old boy in this house this morning? Is, is Austin coming in here? He's back here? Oh, there he is. All right. Very good. Here we go. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. We're going to read through 50. And I'm sorry for the inconvenience of not having it on the overhead, but uh, somebody didn't want it up there, so it's not up there. But we're not going to give him any credit. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy, Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not Know it. But supposing him to be in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple. Somebody say three days. He was sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who had heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, Mary and Joseph, when they saw Jesus, when the parents saw Jesus, they were amazed. <clears throat> I bet they were. We kind of read over this and like don't put the emotion to it and, and the actual context of how it would have felt to be there that day, right? Right? But they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, I can't even put it into words what she said. It only states a few lines. And I guarantee the conversation wasn't as, uh, let's just say, Luke left some of it out. Right? Austin, make your way up here, please. He says, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. My message today is very simple. It's not going to be long, but it's gonna, I'm going to go at it, all right? You might not like me when I'm done, but my message today is don't lose Jesus any time, but especially at Christmas time. I had to, I looked high and low for a 12-year-old boy. I did not find him, but this guy is 11. He's a friend of mine. His name is Austin. And I know his mom and dad, okay? I have a 10-year-old. You're at about, when, when is your birthday, Austin? August 29th, he'll be 12 years old. Now imagine Kyle and Angie going to Columbus and no, let's make it a day's trip. Where would a day end up being? South Carolina, maybe. And realizing that Austin's not in the car. What would, what would they do? What do you think they would do? They'd keep going, yeah. I know. <laughs> Here's a 20. Here's a 20. They would keep going, right? No, they would turn around and they would come and they would search high and low. Now, the Bible says that it took them three days to find Jesus. And where was he? He was right where they had left him. Can you imagine leaving a young man behind and not even knowing it? They supposed he was with the others. They just assumed for three days. Huh? You may go. God bless you, young man. Love you. I, do I need to say anything more or can I quit? Y'all know where I'm going with this? 
We do the same thing. Or don't we? Are you guys all good? We live our lives, we get caught up in the schedule of Christmas and everything that's going on around it and we forget about Jesus. We forget where we left him, don't we? Oh, I would just assume that he's here this morning. Did anybody bring him? Am I the only one? I want to study that scripture a little bit because today in our culture, so many times, rather than being drawn close to Christ, we actually get drawn farther away. It's just the grim reality of the human race and of the society and of the culture that we live in. And guess what? If you look at that scripture closely, it was right in the middle of a religious celebration called the Passover, which actually was implemented back when the children of Israel were in Egypt. Do you remember the story when they put blood on the doorpost and the death angel would pass over them and their sons would be spared? That was called the Passover, and then every year after that, they were called to remember it. They called the Feast of the Passover. That's what Mary and Joseph were actually taking Jesus to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast, which was for him. It was, the celebration was about him. He was the Passover lamb that was coming. And the celebration was about him, and then they went and forgot him. They lost him. And I don't believe that we're much different. Luke chapter 2, telling of a 12-year-old Jesus going with his parents to celebrate a religious celebration, the Passover feast, and it was about him, and they lost him in the middle of the celebration. If we're not deliberate and we're not intentional, with our lives, we too will, we will lose Jesus. The, and I'm not talking about the relationship of Jesus. I'm talking about the fellowship of Jesus. We walk away from it. They left and they walked step by step, one step at a time. They were walking those days. They didn't have a car. And every step they took, they were getting farther and farther away from Jesus and didn't even know it. And we're no different. We're no different. Is it possible to lose him in the middle of a Christmas celebration? I believe it is. So how can we lose him would be the question. I'm not talking about relationship. I had said that. I'm talking about our fellowship. Because, see, Jesus, or Joseph and Mary, their relationship with Jesus didn't change. Just because they walked away from him, lost him, so to speak, for three days, didn't take away the fact that they were still his earthly mother and his earthly father, right? The relationship part was still there, but the fellowship was severed. They hadn't talked to him in three days. And I believe that it is possible with, for us as Christians today, people on earth today, to actually be in a relationship with God, but forget about our fellowship and, re and, and neglect our fellowship with him. We tend to not be intimate with him. We know him. And we love him and we say we do, but we don't take it in in an intimate and powerful way. I am not of Baptist theology, but I do believe that, that I can't lose my relationship with God. But I can, not very easily. But I can lose my fellowship. And I say that because I believe that the preacher can lose his fellowship. I believe that the people can lose their fellowship with God, with Jesus. I believe they can lose him. I believe our worship team, there's people that, I believe they're just as human as we are, don't you? The only one person. Do you believe they're as human as we are? Yeah. So they can lose it. And it, it, it doesn't exclude anyone. 
And if I lose my fellowship with him, eventually, if I don't reinstate that or reconnect with him, eventually I will, down the road, I will lose my relationship with him. Scripture says, and Jesus said it in red. I would have loved to put it up there. It says it in John chapter 10, verse 28. He says it like this, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Now, some of the, the translations actually say, pluck you out. You can't be plucked out of God's hand. I want to make something really clear to anyone here who would have eternal insecurity. I will tell you, and I can't be emphatic enough to tell you, that I am in the hand of Jesus. And nothing or no one in this world can pluck me out of that hand. I can walk out, but you can't pull me out. Amen? If that were the case, then the devil would be busy snatching people out of the hand of God. And I don't believe that he can do that. If he, if he could do that, I believe he would be doing it. And the only reason he hasn't done it is because he can't. Am I making sense? I don't want to get to eternity. Thank Jesus for saving my soul and give the devil credit for not taking me out of God's hand and say, hey, thanks for not taking me out. I see you take, took some other people out, but not me. That doesn't make sense to me. I'm open for correction, but that doesn't make sense to me that he could do that. I'm not going to give him credit for leaving me alone. I am saved, and the devil in the world and nobody in it can do anything about it. Why? Because I'm sealed by the promise of what? Phil, finish it. The Holy Spirit, right? We're sealed by that. But it is possible to lose fellowship with Jesus. That's possible. And I believe it's more prevalent than what you really want to admit it to be. The people who you would least expect to lose fellowship with Jesus lost it. They lost it. That's Mary and Joseph. You can read all through script, Scripture. There's over and over. There's chosen people. The Bible would give us stories of real life people not just characters of Scripture that were chosen, hand-chosen by God, that for seasons in their life lost Jesus, the fellowship part of Jesus. Read the story of Noah. At one, in a little bit of a season of his life, he lost the fellowship. Think about David. He lost fellowship with Jesus for a season of his life. Think about Samson. He woke up. He woke up and said, oh man, if the spirit just hadn't left me. But it was too late. The Philistines had him. You know the story. They gouged his eyes out and made him a slave. He lost his fellowship with Jesus. Peter, a disciple of Jesus. Think about that. He walked with him every day. And there was a season in his life, it was one evening, that he lost his fellowship with him. And you know what happened? He denied him three times, cut a man's ear off. You can lose it too. Don't deceive yourself. You can lose it too. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says it this way, that therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It's possible for you to lose Jesus and still love him. I believe that with my whole heart. And I don't want to go through Christmas, and I don't want to go through my life or any time 
know about him, sing about him, act like I'm worshiping, worshiping him, hear about him, and not be in close relationship with him. So you say, well, where do we lose Jesus? This scripture would tell us, this passage would tell us where they lost him. And some of our thoughts, obviously, they go straight to uh, places where, you know, dens of sin, so to speak, like a bar or a club or something like that, right? That's not where they lost him. They lost him in the middle of a religious celebration. Passover was about him, and Christmas is too. It's supposed to be. So it is possible that in the middle of all our celebration here this month, and I was talking to someone this morning, and it's like our schedule is so jam-packed in December. Why is that? Is any other month that way? Mine is crazy. I don't even have time to feed my deer. The reindeer. I believe we can become so distracted that we lose our fellowship with Jesus, who is the reason for our holidays that we're having. I'm not opposed to celebrating Christmas. I don't want you to think that I'm some Scrooge or the Grinch. I love it. I love the decorations. I love the lights. I love the parties. I love the food. Oh, yeah. I love the gift exchange. I love the family element of it. I love it. I absolutely love it. But if we're not careful, we will allow Jesus to cramp our style at his birthday party. We don't have time. I was talking to Becky about this, and she has this Bible app that she's trying to read through the Bible, the whole Bible, in a year. And she gets these streaks. How many do that, like with streaks, and they build these streaks up, and then all of a sudden you miss a day and you lose all the streaks? It's real. We live in a busy, busy time. She's like, it's, it hurts her so bad inside if she misses one of those because those streaks are important to her. It shows the progress of reading the scripture all the way through. We let the celebration of Christmas take Christ out of it, and that shouldn't be because it's all about Jesus. So where do we lose him? in the middle of the celebration, how do we lose him? Well, how did they lose him? It's, they didn't oppose him or even deny him. They lost Jesus through assumption. They assumed, they just assumed that he was in the middle of their family. Luke chapter 2, verse 44, it says it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they were traveling as a group, and they just assumed that he was along. I don't want that to happen here. I want this church and everyone in it to have a healthy, vital relationship and fellowship with Jesus. Let's not just assume that he's here. Let's do some self-examination in our own lives. That's, I can't do that for you. You have to do it on your own. And let's check ourselves. Let's see where we're at in our fellowship with Jesus. Because we can't have the joy of Christmas without the worship of Jesus. You can have all the celebration, the lights, the decorations, the trees, but you can't have the joy of Christmas without the worship of of Jesus. The Bible says that they went a day's journey. Think about that. One step at a time, they were just slowly but surely walking further and further away from Jesus. We do the same thing. 
I say that no love is greater than the love that you have for Jesus Christ. And no other focus should be greater in your life than the one that you have, the focus that you have on Jesus. Let's not allow any distractions for Christmas. Then you think about how long has it been? For them, it was three days. How long has it been for you? Three days, three weeks, three months, three years? I don't know. I'm not the judge of that. The Holy Spirit will show you that. How do we find Jesus again? And I think it's interesting because Mary and Joseph found him exactly where they left him. They made that one-day trek back and They were looking around, not expecting him to be where they had left him. But there he was. And he didn't leave them. They left him. Isn't that how it works? That's how it works in my life. I I tend to sometimes slip away. and He's not leaving me. I'm leaving him. So come back. To where you left him. That's where you will find him. Come back to Jesus today. You say, well, I don't know. I'm not quite sure where it happened. Scripture would tell us in Psalm chapter 139, verse 23, David says this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. I will tell you, if you open your heart to God and reveal it, and the Holy Spirit will reveal where you left him, and he will allow you to find him again. And I promise you, it's right where you left him. It's right where you left him. Make a conscious decision to not lose Christ. Make a conscious decision that your family won't lose Christ, and that your children won't lose Christ, that your friends won't lose Christ. How many know what you're celebrating? It's not the lights, it's not the trees, it's not the trips, it's not the vacation. It's Jesus. As I was studying that, it was was like, I know that Kyle and Ange would not keep going if Austin was missing. There's nothing that would pain you more than to lose your 12-year-old child, any child but 12, and not know where they're at. Becky had a good question. She said, do you think there were kidnappers around in those days? I don't know. I don't know. But it would pain you, and the most unlikely person in the world, and this is what I want you to know, Don't be hard on yourself. Because the most unlikely person in the world to lose Jesus was Mary. And she lost him. And Scripture, don't condemn her for that. It was a physical, literal loss. I get it. But Scripture doesn't condemn us. It actually welcomes us back. And if Mary lost him, don't fool yourself. You can lose him too. Don't deceive yourself. You can lose him doing religious things. You can lose him sitting in these chairs. Being busy in church, doing all kinds of things in service, in acts of service. You can lose your fellowship with him, and you, you, you can do all of that stuff and still not have a vital, intimate relationship with him. And you'll lose him if you're not careful what you handle and the people you hang out with, where you go, how you talk, and the things that you allow to occupy your heart. You can lose that fellowship if you're not careful. So we need to be careful 
And don't just assume that Jesus is still with us. Not only did Mary lose him, she didn't even know it. Ask your neighbor, turn to your neighbor and ask him, I wonder if you know. Do it. Oh, you can do better than that. Ask him if you're, as though you're serious. I wonder if you know. Do you know? You can lose him and not know it. We become, we become callous. We become passive. We become busy. And as I read the, the church at Laodicea, I know that uh, Matthew had a message two Sundays ago. He talked about the churches in, in Revelation and the church at Laodicea. Jesus in that particular passage was standing outside the door of that church. They were busy. They, they were a church. Light in the Valley is busy. We're a church. It says that they had riches and they, they had no wants. Everything they had, everything they needed, they had and more. And yet Jesus wasn't there. And they didn't even know it. He was outside. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I don't want a church without Jesus in it. Do you? Answer me loud. I can't do it for you. I cannot do it for you. You'll have to do it for yourself. I don't want Jesus on the outside knocking. I want him in here. We want Christ in this church. They lost him and didn't know it. Rich and increased with goods, having need of nothing. <laughs> if we're not very, very careful, guys, we'll lose the precious anointing of God on our lives. It's serious stuff. We will lose the fellowship and the presence that God wants to have in our lives. And that presence, I will tell you, I've been close and I've been far away and everywhere in between. There is nothing in the world worth more than God's presence in your life and knowing it and feeling it and realizing it from the smallest miracle to the biggest one. It was so interesting. I'm studying for this message and yesterday we had a wedding over at the Encore in Berlin. And this wedding was supposed to be a winter wedding, right? And so they were looking for snow. Now, how many, how many people, it, it hasn't snowed here this year, has it? Not really. And yesterday, I looked out the window, last evening I looked out the window and the snow was just falling down. It was peaceful. And it just sort of set the ambiance of the whole wedding and the reception. And so I said something to Julie, the mother of the bride, and she just, she got tears in her eyes and she goes, Jimmy, it was amazing. She was like, we needed snow so bad today to make this all come together. And here, while they were taking their pictures of the bride and groom, the snow was falling. So I can't wait to see the pictures because just that little thing, we take for granted the presence of God in our lives. It was just snow. But see, when your heart is right with God, you see those things for what, they, for what it is. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We do it. We leave him. We forsake him. And then we don't see all those little miracles. I know it's just a, a simple little thing, but it was quite impactful to think that he cared enough to send the first decent snow for their pictures and for their reception. Isn't that good? God deserves a clap offering this morning. He loves us that much. And how many people look right over that? What's he doing for you in your life? What are the small things that he's doing for you in your life? Are you recognizing them? Is your fellowship with him that good and intimate that you see it for what it is? 
that presence, God's presence, and the realization of that presence is worth more than anything you can buy. We take it for granted. We take it for granted. We just assume, don't we? We just assume that he's with us. We don't do that in our business, do we? We, get, we check them books, don't we? We know the balance sheet. We know exactly what we have and what we don't have. But when it comes to Jesus, you say, well, I guess he's there. I go to church every Sunday. I help at the thrift store. I do kind deeds and give gifts. I, I assume he's there. Do you know that he's there? Because you don't have to be a vile sinner to lose Jesus. They lost him right in the middle of the temple while the preaching and the teaching and the singing and all the things we do, Phil. I'm not exempt from it. You're not exempt from it. Let's not lose Christ this Christmas. As I was, some of the things that came to my mind is, where do we find him? Like, where did they find him? They found him right where they left him. I had to think of the prodigal son. It's the same, same scenario, basically. Just he chose to walk away from his father. And yet, after the years of all the, the sin and all of the, the lifestyle that he was living, when he came back, his father was right where he had left him. And our Heavenly Father is exactly where we leave him. He's there for us. Mary comes back and she's, he's right where she left him. And she said, what in the world were you doing? Can you imagine that conversation? If you lost him, if you've lost him, listen to this. In Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, this is the Lord speaking through Joel, the prophet. It says, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So Joel then picks it up and he goes, So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is what? Gracious and merciful. That means that God's grace covers our sins and his mercy is bigger and, and more abundant than we could ever, ever dream of. He's slow to anger. Oh, he might be, you might be making him a little hot. But he's slow to anger. He's not angry at you. He's not angry with you. And of great kindness, it says, and he relents from doing harm. He doesn't want to do any harm to you. Doesn't matter how far away from him you drift. You can have that feeling again. Well, I, a couple Sundays ago I was talking about the whole fact of how Becky and I, when we first got introduced like really seriously to scripture and and when we had a an actual authentic change of heart we stayed up until 3 a.m studying scripture now we're just too old to do that anymore are we not but when that passion is burning in us you it, there is no other feeling like that amen 
You can have that back. You can have your joy again. It doesn't matter what you're walking through in your life. You can have that joy again because God says, return to me. He'll take you back. He'll take me back anytime. You can have Christ this Christmas. He wants you to come back and find him exactly where you left him. Brennan, if you'll bring your team up. I need special prayer from you guys. Tomorrow I meet with a young lady who claims she's gone too far. God would never forgive her. So she's talked about ending her life and she's threatened to do it. And I'm going to ask that you guys pray for me tomorrow. Start today. Would you do that? Will you promise me you'll do that? I don't know that I have the right words. All I know is that God's grace is huge. And she did not go too far. The enemy has her convinced that she did. But if you look at her life, I guarantee you it was one step at a time walking away. Scripture tells me that in one instant, you can be right back and find him right where you left him. And that's going to be my message to her tomorrow. I'm excited and I'm scared. Does that make sense? I believe that she can have the best Christmas that she's ever had because I believe She's going to find Jesus. And he's he's exactly where she left him. Would you guys stand? You can turn it on. His grace is greater than any of our sins. He's saying that if you want me, you will find me right where you left me. My encouragement to you is don't assume. Don't just assume that he's with you. Make effort. It doesn't even take a lot. Make an effort to talk to him and say, you know what, I have been. Maybe it's three days, maybe it's three weeks, maybe it's been three years since you really had a conversation with him. He'll take you back. He's right where you left him. and he, you, it'll, it'll start right where you left off, I promise. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 29 says it this way. You will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. Somebody say, you will find him. If you seek him with your whole heart and with all of your soul. Make an effort. Don't go through the, get this Christmas. Don't go another day without finding him. Without that intimate relationship. Amen? One person, amen? There you go. If y'all wouldn't respond, I'd just keep going. Love you guys. Becky and I appreciate each and every one of you. And it is an absolute honor to pastor here. It's an absolute honor to serve you in that way. But it is my desire that all of us band together Hold each other accountable. Let's find Jesus in a more personal way. Let's do our best to give him everything he deserves this Christmas. Amen? Hold your hands like this. We're going to pray. Father God, I thank you so much.